Welcome to another Thursday with Third Path webinar. I am really excited about today's guests. Uh, we basically have three people on today's call, myself included, who are passionate about future dads, present dads, uh, really interested in saying the world can be a better place because we really support dads to do the kind of caring that they want to do. Um, and I think you're going to learn from both Brad Harrington and from uh, Josh Levs that they bring a lot of expertise to this conversation. Um, and so, you know, both of them been brought in today because I think they're going to tell you something that helps you understand as a dad or a mom listening in today that there really are some great options for dads to be involved with caregiving. You're going to also see some pictures of children in today's webinar because really I have a bias. I think life is pretty awesome when we have time to be actively involved in the care of our children. And so I've always imagined a future where men could be involved with that same fun, wonderful thing too, actively involved in the care of their children. But what you're going to hear today is that there's some big obstacles to that. And so what we will hopefully help you learn as you hear some of the information today is that these obstacles are, are, are things you can overcome. And you'll hear some real hands-on stories about how these guys have been researchers and doers and involved dads and in what they've done to make this happen. All right, so I have a little bit of a bias. I have a bias that um, there really is a benefit to get dads more involved in the care of their children. And what you're going to hear from Brad in a little bit is that they've got some great research that shows dads want to get more involved with their kids too. But in the backdrop, we're going to talk about some things that get in the way, and we're going to share some stories about that. But, you know, what you can see right here, and I'm going to show you one other couple of the slides from Brad's research, is that, you know, a big majority of dads want to get more involved. They've done some work with dads across the board. They've also looked at millennial dads. And what you can see in that research that I'm putting on the screen right now is that the majority of dads want to get more involved, want to take paternity leave, want flexibility so they can stay actively engaged in the care of their kids. In fact, we're going to get Brad to talk about this in a second. He saw that there were kind of three camps of dads, and we're going to talk about them in a little bit. Uh, one camp, the egalitarian dads, are dads who really are interested in playing kind of an equal role or certainly a shared role in caregiving. Um, and, and really being a partner in the care of their kids um, versus some traditional dads who are still playing a more traditional role. They are the primary earners. Their partners are the primary caregivers. And then there's this group called conflicted dads. And what you'll hear Brad talk about in a second is that, you know, in general, their research was showing that egalitarian dads are maybe even a little happier than these other two categories and that conflicted dads, like the name implies, feels they feel pretty conflicted. Um, and we're going to talk about, well, why are they so conflicted? That's a big piece of what we're going to look at today. One of the things I noticed when I looked at Brad's research is that there was one place where uh, the traditional dads maybe looked less uh, unhappy. And that's where it's around their career progress or the amount of income they're earning. And I think that's going to be at the heart of some of the things we talk about today is that there is still a couple of different models out there around how men can do family. And there's some strong things that influence men in one direction or the other. Men can do family where they still play a traditional role. And what we can see from this slide is they probably are going to have some better career progression, earn more money that way. But there's a growing population of men who want to do family differently. They want to be involved. And what I think Brad's going to tell you is that they're, they're seeing that these dads who want to get more involved have some real joy from that choice and are happy with their work and life choices, getting more involved in the, their, their kids' lives and playing more of an active role at home. The last thing I want to say before we talk a little bit about these slides is that, yes, we're going to talk about early years when we're uh, starting off care of the kids and there's we got a new baby at home. But one of the big messages Third Path talks about 
is that the need for care keeps on going on way beyond babies. Um, in fact, I'm dealing with elder care now. So even though I'm an empty nester, I'm dealing with care again. Um, and so as we think about dads and we imagine these future dads making choices that feel important to them, I'm hoping we'll remember that care is an ongoing thing and how can we help them as they reach for their goals. So I put a lot of information up there. I'm happy to go back to any of those slides, Brad. I'm going to start with you. You've got this three groups of dads. Maybe I'll put that mm -hmm. slide back here up again. Yeah. And um, tell us a little about these dads. And then I want to hear from Josh because you too have been looking at some of this stuff and hear your thoughts about all of this. Okay, thanks, Jan uh, Jessica. Um, I'll just say a couple of words about our, our our background in this in this arena. Um, it was back in 2009 um, that we, I guess, after about eight or nine years as the director of the center, I, it became painfully obvious to me that dads were not, you know, a very present part of the conversation in work family. Um, when I'd go to conferences, whether they were academic conferences or practitioner ones or working mother or whatever it might be, you would see that you know dads were noticeable only in that they were absent. In, in terms of not being at the conference and also in terms of their um, the conversation just didn't rotate around fathers very much. So it was right around that time, 2008, 2009, that I decided, gee, there is a real dearth of information about about dads and, and a, not much conversation about what their role in the family was. So back then we decided to embark on a study. We had a doctoral student here named Jamie Ladge, who maybe has presented at one of your webinars, and she was doing a study on women who had their first child, took, were in professional positions, had their first child, took paid leave, or took leave, excuse me, and then they returned to the workplace. And she wanted to understand what were the sort of identity issues that women went through when they went through those transitions and when they were full-time focused on being a professional and then for a few months they were focused full-time on being a mom and then they went back to the workplace and had to sort of struggle with how to you know rationalize those two identities and figure out you know who did they owe their allegiance to and all that kind of mm -hmm. thing and uh and whether or not they saw themselves as you know as effective uh in both roles now that they were trying to juggle the two so we decided to mirror that study and do a similar qualitative study with guys men uh who were new dads who had been fathers within the past year and see whether or not they went through a same or a similar type of process that, that the moms did. And as you ex can expect, because fathers didn't take a leave um, and because they spent no time flying solo with their children, very few of them went through that sort of identity. Um, I shouldn't say identity crisis, but that identity struggle that a lot of working moms uh, dealt with. But we did really get to understand in 2009 how much guys aspired to be uh, more involved caregivers um, than their dads were and that that was becoming a reality for them because of the fact that so many of them had a working spouse. So we published our results. We got an incredible reaction to that and um, we decided there's a real hunger out there to learn more accurately about a picture of today's father. So we decided to uh, to continue the the uh, exploration. And the next year we went from a qualitative study with 35 fathers to a quantitative study with 970 fathers. So over the course of that, you know, those years, uh, every year we tried to take a slightly new perspective on fathers. So we did one year we did at home dads, one year we did paternity leave, one year we did um, uh, millennial dads and so forth. So what we were able to do is kind of get some some sort of indications about I think somebody it might be whistling at me, Je Jessica. Sorry, yeah, sorry. <laughs> but that's okay. No, um, so we got an opportunity to really get to you know know more and more about fathers. And one of the things we were struck with, especially in our early studies, was the percentage of fathers who saw their their role as re really being a blend between uh, caregiving and uh, breadwinning. So, uh, in one study where we had about a thousand fathers respond. 70% of them said, I see my role as an equal balance between breadwinning and caregiving. And we thought that it would be more biased toward breadwinning. But really, these dads who were working in Fortune 500 companies suggested that that's not the way they perceive themselves. Um, <clears throat> the other thing was that a lot of the fathers, and I think that might have been on your other slide, said they wanted to spend time with their kids. 77% said they would like to spend more time with their kids than they currently do. Um, uh, that, that's the millennial slide. So in, yep. the, in the larger study, it was 77%. 
the downside was that 58% said they all also want to reach a role in senior management with their very large organizations. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you know popped up then was wow, um, there's a conflict brewing there between their career goals and their and their personal aspirations yep. around parenting. So um, that theme around the sense of conflict that exists within dads was something that we continue to to study further and further and if you go to the next slide Jessica mm -hmm. um, as you said in the last studies we did the millennial dads and the more broad-based one of generations what we found is that um, you know the guys broke up into three groups and they were roughly speaking about 32 percent of the fathers fell into the uh, uh, conflict uh, I'm sorry, the egalitarian mode, about 32% fell in the traditional mode and about uh, 36 or 37% fell into the conflicted mode. And we identified these guys by looking at the answers they gave to questions in terms of, you know, did were they sort of s suggesting, although not labeling them so themselves, were they suggesting that they were conflicted in their, in their struggle between, you know, their professional and personal aspirations. So, we then went on and broke the sample into three groups and basically tried to understand if you look at the traditional egalitarian and conflicted fathers, what was their difference in terms of life satisfaction and job satisfaction and were there marked differences between the three groups? And as this slide demonstrates, and we've got lots of other slides that look very much this way, um, in, in general, the egalitarian fathers, especially in the millennial egalitarian fathers, tended to be the happiest in their career, uh, in their work, and in their in their, in their lives outside of work. Um, the um, traditional fathers, not quite as happy. They they were happy in terms of the markers they had attained in terms of career advancement and, and salary, but not as happy overall with the quality of their uh, their life. Um, and then the uh, the conflicted dads on virtually every measure, maybe one or two for an exception, were the most unhappy and the most dissatisfied with the present state of their job, their career, and their life um, back in the home. So we titled the last uh, study that we did the career caregiver conflict because this this notion of fathers feeling kind of uh, a dissonance between their parenting role and their professional role is something that became clear to us that there was a significant percentage of fathers who did feel that way and that that was really corrosive in terms of their sense of satisfaction and fulfillment uh, yes. in both sphere in both spheres of their life yes. so I'll just leave it there and uh, turn it back over to you yeah, no, thank you. So, so I hope what you guys listening in today or listening to the recording of today's call really hear is that there's been some excellent research done showing that dads are in this big transition. And I hope what you'll leave today's call here understanding is, you know, that there's some tough choices that they're up against. Josh, you've been out there talking with dads. I'm going to put up a, kind of just a fun picture as we hear you talk a little bit about you out there talking with dads. Um, tell us a little bit about what you've been finding about dads today. Um, as we think a little bit about the message we want to tell future dads as they're thinking about these issues. Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, basic background, I spent 20 years as a journalist, and a lot of what I was doing on air at CNN and then also online was piecing through studies and research about all kinds of topics to find out which ones are real, which ones are fake, which ones have actual, like, legit numbers in them based on sample sizes and all this. Um, and then I started taking that fact-checking lens and turning it onto parenthood, fatherhood. So I came to see what's really going on with fatherhood and the extent to which what men are going through, the kind of struggles Brad talks about, um, that that's been happening in the shadows. And uh, you know, Brad does excellent research, and I quoted him in my book a couple of years ago. You know, we, we keep getting more uh, information about this, and there's a couple of phenomena that are happening at once. Um, we are seeing a greater awareness, which is good, of the fact that men have these struggles, of the fact that men can be caregivers. But we also are, despite all that, despite some announcements from big companies about how they now want to support men as, as equal caregivers, in the big picture in America, um, we actually have really barely budged at all in taking steps to actually address this. And uh, our new research that just came out from ProMundo and Dub Men Plus Care, which I announced last week at, at Carnegie Hall in New York, and Jessica was a great part of the panel there, um, it highlights this. It shows the extent to which men still don't have the support that they need to address this kind of conflict and to be able to be the caregivers that they wish to be. 
uh, and just a few of the numbers that we've got here, 73% uh, of the fathers interviewed said that workplaces are not supportive to them. And many, many men are very concerned about negative repercussions in the workplace if they dare to talk about or if they try to take paternity leave, um, the full amount that's available. And not only are they worried about it, but this is extreme. One in five are actually worried about the worst of the consequences, which is losing their jobs if they dare to take paternity leave. And that's based on something real. It's based on the fact that it happens. So what we are seeing here is, despite the fact that we have this great research and that we have been hearing some good things in the news and that there are these developmental agencies like, like Third Path that are working with families and businesses to address this, we still have a very long way to go. It's also important to understand that just as men um, are experiencing this kind of work-life conflict, we dads are also uh, making changes in our careers, but we're not telling people, including our bosses, about those changes. So our new research found what I've seen before, 69% um, of dads are willing to change jobs to, have, to be very involved in their kids' early lives. So it's slightly more than the percentage of moms that says 66%. And um, this is similar to what EY found a couple of years ago, that men in America are even more likely than women to change jobs or careers, take pay cuts, or move to another state or country in order to have more time with their families. Uh, but what I see consistently as I work with businesses on this and is, is that they don't know what's happening. So businesses think, the bosses think, the guy got a job somewhere else, and that's the reason he left. They don't know that he's taken a $25,000 pay cut to work somewhere else where he feels supported as a father. So a lot of what I do with businesses now is crunch the numbers and show them how incredibly expensive it is to replace employees and show them the cost of attraction and retention and how really addressing this, not just through paternity leave, but through creating cultures in which men are supported, in which we understand that men and women experience work-life conflict, that we all need to address it together, um, the extent to which that builds profits. So. That is enormous. That is the big hump that we have to get over. Helping more and more businesses come to understand that this is the reality, and that the more we all work on it together, the more we all benefit. Expanding the economy, helping families, helping children, helping women, helping the cause of gender equality, helping men. It really does benefit everyone for us to understand modern fathers, address this, and make sure that they can be the workers and parents that they wish to be. Yeah, and and so what's funny listening to you, Josh, and I don't mean to sound like the cynic here, so so bear with me. Hear what I'm going to say, then I want to hear you respond. I'm looking at this bottom right-hand picture of this lovely two-year-old playing, and that's how old my son was when I started Third Path, and now he's 21. And I'm thinking, I'm listening to your words and saying, wow, when are we going to, how long do we have to wait for all this to happen? Like, I want this to happen yesterday for dads because it's so critical. It's going to help dads. It's going to help moms. I want this to happen yesterday. So where we're going to go next is in this conversation, what we're saying is, okay, dear future dads, we need better and supportive organizations. We need better supportive public policy. But what can we help you with today? tomorrow when you become a dad. Um, you might have a thought about that before I put up a next slide, Josh, but that's where I get anxious. It's like, I don't want too much more time to go by. I want to help dads today. Uh, do you have a thought about that before I put up the next slide? Yeah, that it takes a lot of effort. It takes all of us. I mean, you know, I say this all the time. I grew up believing in gender equality. I grew up listening to this album called Free to Be You and Me, which is all about how men and women grow up and men can change the diapers too and women can work too. We can all scrub the floors and <laughs> <laughs> so many of us really thought we would have gender excuse me, gender equality, yeah. and we don't. Yeah. So we have to address this right now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's where we're going to go. And again, you're listening in with some people who've done some amazing work around this, amazing research around this, um, and, and lived lives themselves where they've been really trying to think about these issues. So that's where I want to go next. I'm going to put up one more slide that really hit me. Uh, again, we're kind of looking at the millennial data because I thought, oh, when I read the millennial data, you know, we'd see a lot of change. We, we've got a lot of hopes for these millennials. Um, and what I was really struck by, Brad, and we're not going to talk a lot about this, but I just want to put it out there. I was really struck by how 
gendered there was how gendered the assumptions still were around caregiving. So it's not just our assumptions around how we do work, not just our assumptions about what our boss is going to think if we do something. I was looking at this and I was really struck by, you know, if my child is sick, I have responsibility to care for him or um, I'm uncomfortable if my partner provided more care than me. Look how gendered that is. Do you have a thought about that, Brad, before I put up my next slide? Well, I guess the good news is it isn't 100 zero. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you know. <laughs> It's, you know, the difference is generally around 10 percent uh, uh, for many of the questions. Um, but it does suggest, uh, I mean, when we when we talk about our, our sample for both the millennials and for the baby boomer and Gen X groups that we looked at, you know, the sample is still, um, you know, about 30 to 33 percent of the men fit into a traditional category. So one of the things you have to temper your concern with is there are a third of the men here. Uh, who believe, and I guess they believe that their spouse believes that it's their spouse's primary role to watch, you know, and to take care of the kids, and it's the dad's primary role to be, um, you know, the the, the breadwinner. Mm -hmm. And so, if those if those families still exist, and, and in our sample it was about a third, where if you looked at the the, you know, the, these so-called traditional dads. Um, you know, obviously 100% of the ones in our study worked. By contrast, their spouses, it was like 15 or 20% of their spouses worked. Mm -hmm. So part of it, could, part of that difference could be chalked up to the fact that hopefully they and their spouse have had a conversation and they've decided what's best for their family at this particular point in time is to divide the caregiving and the breadwinning roles. Mm -hmm. And so part of this, the responses that you see here might be a result of the fact that the guys who said, well, I've struck this agreement with my spouse and this is what her primary role is. And my primary role is to, is to bring home, you know, the, the, uh, the, the finances. So that, you know, that's going to color into this to some degree. The other thing uh, that's on a more positive note, which I, I don't know if you noticed, but there's only one where the um, the men scored higher than the women on that, and, and that was the question, or one where men scored higher than the women, uh, suggesting great, a move shift toward greater gender equality, and that was the one where they said it's okay to be, you know, if they, we asked the question, if your partner earned enough money that they could take care of your family's needs, would you consider being a stay-at-home parent? And 45 Four percent of the women said I would consider that, and fifty-one percent of the men said they'd consider that. Right. So, you know, they may not be willing to step up and take as much responsibility uh, while while uh, both are working, but they are slightly more willing to say, if one of us had to stay home, it would be okay if it was me. So, yeah. you, we have to take some uh, solace in the fact that there's, a, 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 you know, a little bit of a, a shift going on there in terms of men seeing being an at-home dad as a viable thing to do. Even yeah. though the vast, even though the vast majority of people who do it are women. Well, and or or what I saw, and, and again, tell me if I'm, I'm miss. And you know, I know you did this a while ago, but I just was really struck by it. This was kind of your millennial mothers and millennial fathers data. So you, yes. this is where you're comparing the moms and the dads who are millennials, mm -hmm. and and where I was trying to get to. And, and again, I might be misinterpreting it. Please, please correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Is what we've seen at Third Path is that it's a little bit about what's happening at work and it's a little bit about what's happening at home of men yep. and women both thinking differently. And so what we're seeing and what I saw in this data was that, that you know, we got to help millennial moms. Remember, it's okay for dads to take yep. care of a sick child. We got to help millennial moms. Remember that, that, you know, millennial dads can it'd be okay if the dad provided more care than the mom. Uh, yep. that, that, that there's a two people that need to be shifting their mindset in this. Am I interpreting it correctly? Yeah, I would say that's that's absolutely accurate. I think that you know when we did we did a study on at home dads, and they all had spouses who had very responsible jobs and pretty significant earnings for the most part. And when we had an opportunity to speak to the moms, it was one of the only studies we did where we had a chance to speak to the dads and the moms in, in one couple. And we said to the moms, you know, how has ha having an at-home spouse, um, you know, what is the effect that that's had on your career? Has it enabled you to work longer hours? Has it enabled you to take on jobs, jobs, great responsibility? The answer was yes. And so from, many standpoints so women really appreciated um, having the at-home spouse that had, had empowered them to be able to do uh, what they wanted to do professionally. But the one caveat is that a lot of the women said, however, there's still something inside of me that when I see my kids run to my husband, that I think to myself, that should be me. 
Right. Um, so, so even with women who were the were the breadwinners, where they had a dad who was the caregiver, there was still that that piece of them that said the right solution would have been for me to be in this situation, not him. Yeah. And so, um, so there is still some of that going on, Jessica. And and as much as we've seen tremendous progress, you know, on both fronts, both with women and men, there is still a little bit of a tendency for men to say, my go, my go-to position is being a breadwinner. And for women to say, my go-to position is I should be the lead caregiver. Yeah. And what do you think about that, Josh? Is that ringing any familiar bells with some of the research you guys were doing or what we talked about at the, that wonderful event last week? with Dove Men Plus Care. You have to think about the way that kids are raised. You know, <laughs> one of the big I always tell people, even if you're never going to have kids, that making paternity a, a, a reality is something you need to understand. That is the way in the long run to create actual gender equality because kids need to grow up seeing, not just hearing you say it, but seeing mom and dad be equal at home and at work if they want to really internalize that. That's how things can work. Uh, Talk Jeff. about. Yeah, I got rid of that sound. It's gone. Um, I don't know what that was. I, I have a chapter in my book in which I talk about these two phenomena. It's uh, male privilege and female gatekeeping. Mm-hmm. And the idea that we can fall into these ideas because of the ways that we're raised. There might be moments in which a guy thinks, well, you know, this really is more yours, honey. You're, you're better at it, natural, whatever. And there are moments in which moms say, no, 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 that's not how you hold the baby. No, 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 that's not how you change the baby. And that has to do with how we're raised, you know. <laughs> a baby has usually grown inside the mom. She wants to protect it. And she's grown up with these images of the clueless, helpless dad who doesn't know how to do anything. And so we can fall into those tropes, those stereotypes on our own if we're not careful. So, yes, absolutely. Another piece of this is always to really take a good, hard look at how we are living our daily lives and see how we can confront our own assumptions. Yeah, yeah, wonderful. What a great lead into where I want to go next because I, I think, that, again, with this theme of your future dads, you know what, we've been at this for way too long at Third Path, and, you know, yes, we want supportive organizations. Yes, we want supportive public policy. In the meantime, people have kids. And so what we've seen is, you know, this kind of how a family solves it as an individual family system, uh, it's challenging because you might not be in a supportive workplace. You certainly don't have great supportive policies in the U.S., but you can make some choices. And so a big message we're going to get to next as we talk about this is to kind of help people imagine, okay, you're going to have a kid. You might have a kid in a, in a point in time where we still don't have supportive public policy, still don't have supportive organizations. What can you do? And that's where we're going next is to think a little bit about some options, some choices, how to make this work today. Um, dear future dads, what can you do today? So I kind of summarized what we've learned in 17 years of third path into one little slide. And what I'm trying to get at is that if we wanted to kind of make a blanket generalization about how families fall into three types of care. Um, we, and again, this is really generalizing way, way simply. Uh, this is the model that Third Path has been at, an advocate for a long time, um, but we also realize this model has some consequences. Uh, this model is the idea that both moms and dads can flex their work, because by the way, after they've had dad home for parental leave and mom home for parental leave, then you go go back to work, and the question is, well, what happens next? So in a shared care family, what we try to support is both parents flex their work so they can both share in the care of their kids. But the real truth of this, what we've learned over and over again, is that there's some real risk involved with this. And so often what happens in a family system, for all kinds of reasons, is just one parent flexes. Um, And so, or both work full time, um, and there, there is some reasons to do that. And by the way, one of the best reasons to either do the traditional approach or the full-time care approach is because it's exactly what you want to do. So dear future dad, as you're listening in today, if you're interested in one of these alternative, you know, the traditional model or a full-time care model, that's the future for you. We want to support you, but there's some challenges in each of these approaches. That's what we're trying to talk about today. We're going to share some stories to get this message across, too. Um, so, for example, in, you know, except for the one that uh, 
Brad was talking about, often in a traditional family, it's the mom who does the caregiving, the dad who works. And what that can end up doing is reinforcing all kinds of traditional roles, both at work and at home. And what Third Path is currently see, also seen is in a family where both are working full time and using full time child care. There's many, many families where this works really well, especially in workplaces that support some flexibility. But in workplaces that don't support a lot of flexibility, in workplaces that expect you to work more than 40 hours a week, this can mean that families feel pretty exhausted. And so where I want to go next is to talk a little about some of the choices we've made and to think a little bit about how our stories connect to some of the stuff that um, that uh, Brad's research shows. Um, because I think in telling our stories, we're going to be able to help dads understand uh, what, what they're up against as they're trying to figure this out for themselves. Brad, you and I got a chance to talk a little bit about some of this yesterday, and I appreciate that. You know, you... You're a great story because in your story, it shows how it changes over time. You want to share yeah. a little bit about how you balanced work and family over the, uh, the course of your children's lives and how it's changed over time? Sure. Um, so I think when we talked, Jessica, I mentioned to you that when my wife and I first got married, um, she was a higher education professional working full time. And I was a, a, a corporate uh, manager and executive with a, a global uh, computer company, Hewlett Packard, and um, so for a number of years, we, we, you know, before we had kids, about four years, we we just continued to both be full time, and then we had our first child, and my wife continued to uh, work full time for a while, uh, and then the second child came along, and she reduced her hours to part time. Right after that. I began this weird journey <laughs> where I was living in Boston and working in Palo Alto. So two weeks a month, I would be not only you know tied up with work, but I would be 3,000 miles away from home. During that period of time, we made a decision that it was in the best interest of the family that one of us stay home full time and the disparity in our earnings was pretty great. Uh, being in uh, the corporate sector versus higher education, my salary was you know, many times higher than my wife's, and I was the one who was doing all the traveling. So she decided that she would stay home full-time uh, with the kids, and we went from, I guess what you would call full-time care to traditional, um, a traditional arrangement. And uh, for a number of years, um, that worked well for us. We had a third child right after that. And um, and so being in this traditional arrangement, it just it kind of made sense. And, it, you know, the divide and conquer thing worked well. But as the kids got older and my wife had a doctorate it, as well and had worked in higher ed for many years, she decided she wanted to go back to work at least part time. So about 12 years ago, she got a job at Tufts University working three days a week and having summers off. Um, so she took a couple of months off in the summer and worked a three-day week. You know, so obviously she was at a reduced work schedule and reduced pay level, but it gave her an opportunity to, to rekindle her career, which was in, uh, uh, important to her. Um, and then just a few years later, um, she then returned to work full-time and then was pro promoted to the senior director of her center. Um, and so at that point, um, for the last, say, eight years or so, we both are back to working full time. Uh, I've left the corporate sector, as you know, and gone into academia, which had a lot of rewards, but they weren't financial. Uh, <laughs> and so and so the, 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 the difference between my earnings and my wife's is now, you know, way different than it used to be. And I don't know what the split is. It might be 60-40 or 62-38. I, I have no idea yeah. what the split is, but it's somewhere in that, that arena. Yep. And because of that, we've really decided that, you know, it was time to shift to more, more of a shared care model. And the last thing I'll say is the shared care model doesn't mean we all do everything, uh, you know, like I do not cook ever. So my wife is a very good cook, and she enjoys food, and she goes and does the grocery shopping and does the cooking. Um, she hates doing the laundry. Uh, I do the, all of that, and I, I'm the house cleaner. Um, so I do the house cleaning and laundry. She does the uh, the cooking. So within our at home roles, we've specialized. But when it comes to the kids, we, we uh, you know we spend time. Mostly our kids are older now. So the oldest is 22 and the youngest is 17. So most of our time in the last few years prior to them getting to college age was spent um, 
uh, you know, what are taxiing them from place to place basically yeah. <laughs> until they get their license. So, but you know, I would say today, I would think my wife and I are in very much of a shared care model, although we now only have one child at home. But for the last few years, you know, we've we've gone through each of these three stages, and we've just tried to make work what would work best given our individual, you know, professional and personal responsibilities. Thank you so much for sharing your story, and I and I wanted to underscore a couple things, and then Josh, I'm going to. You're at a very different family stage, and I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about it too, because I think what what happens in Brad's story, as you're listening in, Dad, as you're listening in, Mom, to this, um, is that one thing you hopefully hear in Brad's story is that things keep on changing, and I'm going to put up another slide in a little bit that reminds us again that families keep on changing, um, but also that you know. There's a little bit of a uh, influence by what both parents want, what the workplace uh, is expecting, what the job demands are, um, and so that things can shift. And that what you really hear is that, you know, Brad and his wife kept on working together and coming up with a solution that made sense for them at each stage. Um, and they've evolved into this model that really feels like, I bet it feels like a real team at home where you really are working together. You've been working together all the way along, but you, you really have some appreciation about what it means to kind of set some limits at work so you have time for family. You've got some understanding about what it means to really be able to be there for your family. How does that, how does that work for you today when you think back? Uh, what do you like about where you are today as a family system? What's, what's been enjoyable about that? Is that me or Josh? That's you, Brad. Then I'm going to go to Josh. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I think every transition had its bumps uh, along the way in the yep. sense of saying, you know, like when I came back from working in Palo Alto, uh, you know, for a week or two, I would come back home and after spending a week in a hotel in Palo Alto in the sunny weather, and I'd tell my wife how tired I was. <laughs> and, she, and she had two kids and she was, you know, four months pregnant. And she's like, you're tired? Um, <laughs> and then when I transitioned into higher education, um, you know, I kind of brought my corporate mindset with me a little bit. And so there were times during those transition points, or, or when Annie's job became full time and then became as demanding, as, if not more demanding than mine, there were times during those tra transition points that especially I had to make adjustments and probably needed to, you know, talk it through with my wife or more appropriate, maybe listen to my wife and do the kinds of things that, you know, that I needed to do in order to be that shared caregiver. So although the transitions were sometimes a little bit clumsy, I think we ended up in a, in a very good place. And what's nice is that my wife and I both have careers that we find very, very meaningful they're sort of similar in some ways. We're both at centers within universities, um, but we found a place for each of us to do our work and to express our values in that way. But we've also found a place where both of us could be very, very connected to the kids. So it's been, yeah. it's been great over the long run, uh, albeit with a few bumps here and there. Thank you, for, thank you for sharing that too, because I think that's really actually the truth of it all is that um, the bumps are what uh, are part of our life stories. Um, and what I hear that you guys did is you kept on kind of thinking it through together, even the bumps when they happened. And you, you know, it's, this is a big message Third Path has learned a long time ago is that, hey, there are going to be still some difficult external factors for, for dads to do what they really want to do. But the more you get clear internally, you and your partner about mm -hmm. what's important to you, the more you can kind yeah. of continue to navigate over those, those bumps. Um, so yeah. thank you, Brad. I, I, I think when we try to get real about this, it really helps those future dads imagine this too. So thank you. That's exactly what I was looking for. Josh. You, too, have been trying to wrestle through all this. You've been a pioneer in so many ways. Tell us a little bit about how you've been making this work in your family system. Sure. So, um, you know, I was already covering fatherhood at CNN when my legal case suddenly became this big story in the news. So it was a big switcheroo for me to go from the guy who was talking about this in the news as a reporter to suddenly being the guy that the other reporters were talking about. So um, I had a legal case against CNN at Time Warner because... Uh, when my wife was pregnant with our third child, our daughter, we realized that I would be needed at home for caregiving. And the policies at the time were such that anyone could get 10 paid weeks, except a biological father, <laughs> except anyone except a guy in a traditional scenario. And I went to the company and tried to get them to 
exchange it totally in secret, nothing happened. Then after my daughter was born prematurely, my wife was really sick, they still said no, and that's when I took legal action. So that's the short version. Yeah. Um, the big picture here, and this applies to Brad and me and all of us, is that our society does not have structures to make this work. Most societies do, most nations do, and their economies grow as a result. We have nothing set up to make this actually work, so families end up flailing and trying to figure things out. So. In our case, uh, I had to go back to work. I, mean, I am the, the sole provider. Uh, so I did, and that was a really rough time, and my wife was uh, you know, sick and home alone with the two boys and our daughter. Um, but I've been fighting to, to make that change. And what we are seeing is that the states in which there is paid family leave insurance now, uh, it's working beautifully, it's expanding the economy, it's expanding business profits, the numbers are up, all the key metrics that you want to see. And I know this from years of business reporting, these are the real metrics you want to see. You want to see um, hiring, you want to see overall expansion in goods and services, uh, attraction, retention, all these good things. So when there is a paid family leave insurance system in place, um, which is not a requirement on businesses to pay you, it's an insurance system. Workers make this tiny payroll deduction into a fund. And when they need it to care for anyone, a new child, a sick parent, an elderly spouse, or themselves after an illness, they get to pay from that fund. Yeah. It's extremely popular. The vast majority of Republicans and Democrats want it. So when that is in place, what we see is that there actually is some structure, and men are able to take off more often. Now, still, the stigmas apply. The stigmas in which men get punished for taking time off within their workplaces, so there are still a lot of men who are afraid to do it anyway. Yeah. Um, usually it's based on real fear, but the numbers are up, so that's really good. And what we're doing now is working at the state levels, and we tried to work at the federal level, and not much is going to happen right now, but and we're working at state levels, and we're working with businesses to create systems in which this is possible. And what you find is that when you make it possible with pay, and you, more importantly, I would say 20% policy, 80% culture, then you find that men really want to take this time and do. And those numbers can look really good when you address both the policy and the culture. So when you talk about what dads are doing right now, what my family is doing, that's, that's the situation that we're in now. And now my wife, my, my youngest is a little bit older, she's four now. My wife went back to work after all these years. She's now working full time, and I now run my own businesses. I left CNN. I run them out of my house. So I get my daughter to school in the morning, and then when my boys come home from school, I've changed my work schedule. So I have a couple hours with them right then. I don't do work meetings then. I, I do homework with them, and, and we have this time. And then uh, later on, my wife gets home, my daughter gets home. We all have the evenings together. So you know, you're just you're finding the balance and yeah. trying to – make it work in, in whatever way you best can, knowing that we, in general, in America, could all be doing better. Oh, my gosh. Couldn't we? I mean, gosh, that's what makes me so nervous, though. It just feels like time keeps on flying by, and we have so much we need to do to make it more possible for more men to do this. But what you're hearing is that Josh embraced another really powerful solution that so many young dads can have access to and what his research is showing want to do which is that they can actually, we're seeing a trend where moms did this maybe 10 years ago, now dads are doing it where they can leave the workplace and start their own businesses to create the flexibility they need. Because by the way, getting dads involved right from the start is critical, but then we continue to have caregiving needs. And so what you're hearing in Josh's amazing story is that he, like many, many dads today, says, hey, I can do work differently and get a Great job done at work, but I can flex it in a way that meets my family's needs. And so young dads, uh, and we're seeing this kind of qualitatively, not quantitatively, but I think Josh has seen this in his research, young dads are more willing to kind of change jobs, including leave and start their own jobs, as a way to create that flexibility. So, Josh, thank you. That's exactly where I wanted to go, was to show but there's really some solutions out there for dads around how to do things differently. There might be something else you want to add, but thank you for sharing your story, too, and reminding us we need big policy change. We need organizational change. We need all those other changes, too. Any other thoughts, Josh, you want to add? 
Yeah, I mean, it, I don't know if you were going to go there, but one of the things that I learned from my book, it, through you, through Third Path, uh, is that there are more and more business leaders now who are grandparents, mm -hmm. who didn't get to have this the first time around, but when we show them the business metrics and the societal reasons for fixing this, more and more of them want to do this. So you're finding some grandparents now who are changing their schedules. So they're working four days a week and spending one day taking care of their grandkids. Yep. And these guys and mom and men and women are starting to not only do that, but also understand why the policies and the cultures need to change. So instead of saying, well, we didn't have it in my day, why should we have it in your day? They're saying, oh, it is better for business. Oh, it is better for family. Let's make this change. And also, I want to, in my own way, be a part of it. So there are people who, I, I, I keep finding this, when you show them the facts, they're willing to make the change. It's tough, it takes work. And unfortunately, there's still a super long way to go. But when people learn, they actually are willing to embrace this. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we're going to get to a place where we start giving some kind of quick supportive messages for you future dads around how you can make change. Um, and again, one big message is that there's not one way, right way to do things. The future third path imagines is a diverse set of families out there. Not everybody has to do the same thing. But if we really want to focus in on those conflicted dads right now and say and help them, you know, that there, you know, there is some risk involved in the choices that you're facing. But there are some ways to overcome those risks. And there are some choices you can make that will help you uh, not feel conflicted, but more happy with what you're, um, you know, doing around work and family. And so I'm going to show you guys a couple of slides of some of the big takeaways we have from helping uh, moms and dads think about this. And then I'm going to explain the slide and get your thoughts first from Brad, then from Josh. Um, but one big message we've been talking about all year long is that uh, if you're interested in following this more integrated approach where you have time for work and time for life, uh, the big message in this year's calls is that you need you can start this early in your career, or as Josh said, you can start this late in your career, like Ivan Axelrod, who uh, redesigned his job when he became a grandparent. Um, and that the big message we've been saying all year long is that you need some support, you need to experiment, you need to be intentional. So with that in mind, your future dad, what kind of support do you need to build in? Well, you've seen this slide before. I think a big message is, as a, as a parent, think with your partner. What do you guys both really want? What's important to you? Your children are going to grow up fast. Each, each stage of family is different. What do you want today? What do you want five years from now? If you two get on the same page, you can then really think together about how to overcome some of the hurdles that you might face. Um, Brad, you might have a thought you want to add about this none required, and, and I'll check with Josh. In terms of building in meeting. support and the importance of getting the couple on the same page, any thoughts about that? Well, one of the things we did ask in our research was, uh, you know, with with the dads who felt the most happy and satisfied with their life. Another thing we were able to correlate with that was that they the frequency of discussions with their spouse. Uh, had a positive correlation with um, how how positively they were were feeling about their satisfaction both at work and at home. Yeah. So we found that guys who had, uh, in the case of the, when we were studying dads, we found the guys that had frequent conversations with their spouse about how the how the balance was going and how uh, each of them was taking their share of responsibility tended to have more positive um, you know feelings about their work and and their, and their home life as as well. So I, I think that's that's really critical. Um, that's great. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's yeah. probably all I need to say about that. That's yeah. great. And I think your, your story actually emphasized it, too. Even in a traditional relationship, if dad's the one who's the primary earner and mom's the caregiver, it looked like it really made a difference for you guys to talk to and make that work. So at, no matter what family model you choose, yeah. uh, getting, getting on the same page, frequent communication is going to make a difference. Being su mm -hmm. a support to each other in the place that you're at. And we've got a great webinar where we have a couple of uh, stories of dads who really made some changes around how to uh, be involved at home. 
that you can learn more about how to how to be an engaged dad at home if that's what you want to do. Josh, any thoughts about the importance of support, the importance of couples getting on the same page to help dads today? Any thoughts? Yes. People do not know the policies or the laws. Mm-hmm. And when I say people, I mean not just – I mean, first of all, learn these things before you even have kids. Yes. Learn them when you're going to the workplace. Um, workplaces need to start educating their people about it, but here's the really big secret in most workplaces. Even HR teams don't understand where their companies stand on this stuff because our mess of laws and policies in America are just like tangled, inexplicable spider web. And it probably, I, I actually am pretty sure it was not until I, I went to my company and said, hey, anyone can get 10 paid weeks except biological father, that they even knew that. So I even said in my statement at the time, I said, hey, you know, it, it was only discrimination after I pointed it out and they still said no. Before that, they could have said we just didn't realize. And I work with groups of lawyers, I work with HR teams, I actually do official SHRM events, and people do not know. So when you talk about getting on the same page, like, you can't even get on the same page with your spouse until you have found out <laughs> What, what the laws and policies are where you live and where you work. So, so staff is for everyone to get educated about what they even have access to, and that yeah. includes business and, people and you know, workers, and embed that information yeah. oh, and a realistic understanding of how it plays out. Sit yeah. down and make sure together, and don't be afraid. That's the other thing I say is we have to think of the, the anti-dad stigmas, which are still very powerful. There's guys in my book who got fired for taking paternity leave. It happens. So we have to stand up, think of those as a bully, and we have to stand up to them together. Yeah. Yeah. The more we do that, the more we'll make real progress. Wow, I love it. So, so I had been thinking about be intentional as a family system, but I love your point, which is be intentional. Get out there, get the information, find out what your rights are at your organization to do this, um, and then use that information as a family to system to kind of think about what do you want? What do you want when the baby's born? What do you want when the baby, when, when, when that child becomes school ager? Uh, so yes, wonderful. Be intentional. Uh, Josh has made a really good point. Know what your policies are at your workplace. And again, we have a couple of great webinars this year where people have really talked about how they got on the same page, learned some more information, made some big changes. That's terrific. Thank you. Um, and then there's one other big message I feel like I want to say. I'm going to just step back a couple slides, um, which is that, you know, we've really learned that you got to experiment. What did you hear from uh, both of their stories? There was change that happened, and they needed to keep on changing. And that experimentation is part of finding the right answer. Uh, to get there, you need time to reflect. You need to get clear about what you want outside of work and make time for that. You need to do some experimentation at work. And you need to understand that this is going to be an ongoing change, uh, an ongoing process Um, There was one last thing that uh, I think Josh hinted at. We're kind of running out of time, so we might not get to it. One of the other things we really learned over the years is that, you know, when you're working at capacity, turns out it's not really good for the organization to constantly work at capacity or as a person to constantly work at capacity. You need to leave some wiggle room. We actually have a great webinar where we talk about this. But um, that's that's something that I also, uh, if we had time, we would talk some more about that, you know, families need time to think. People need time to think. Our organizations don't really do work, work so well when we're constantly at overload. Um, and so we have some great resources from this year's webinars to help people think a little bit about that, too. But we're running out of time. So I'm going to jump ahead to our closing slides and to say, hey, future dad, Josh made some good Remarks today, know your rights, know the policies at your organization, bring that information back home, think with your partner about what you want to do. We might not be in the perfect world right now, but you can be intentional, you can experiment, you can work together to really create a solution that makes a lot of sense for you. There might be a couple of closing thoughts you want to add, Brad, around some messages for the future dad about what's possible, something you've learned yourself. Josh, I'll then ask you the same question, and then we'll wrap it up. Any last thoughts for the future dad, something you've learned yourself? 
Yeah, well, I mean, just going off what Josh said a minute ago about being aware and, and you said be intentional. The other thing I'll say is be brave. Yes. Um, I, I did a webinar just yesterday, our Father's Day webinar, and there was a, a very large group of people from a particular uh, professional services company. And one of the questions I get asked at the end was, and I happen to know that company offers 12 weeks of paid leave to fathers. And the question was, what do I do about this situation? My organization says they give 12 weeks, but I've never seen a man in my department take it. Yep. And uh, and my vo message to him was somebody has to be the brave pioneer. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and that's probably you. And yep. so I think the last thing, especially as we're talking to men, is you have to be brave because you may, in many instances, be the first person to do this, but it doesn't mean it's not the right thing to do. Yeah, wonderful. That's a perfect message. last message. Josh, there might be one last thought that you want to share. Thank you so much, both of you. This has been terrific. Just what I was looking for. Any last thoughts, Josh? Thank you. Oh, yeah, I just said this is the story of my life. Like, that's exactly what I And I will just add this because I like the positive takeaway at the end. That when you, when you sit down with people and you talk and you take away a lot of the stereotypes, you find that there actually is the potential for this to be the generation in which we make the change. But it requires lots of webinars like this and lots of meetings and lots of phone calls and lots of events and lots of talks. And the more, if everyone who listens to this shares it with someone and they share it with someone, that is the exact kind of change that we need. Yeah, yeah. And again, uh, I love that last, uh, you know, you, you were brave, Josh. Boy, were you brave. Brad, what a great message, be brave. Um, because what, what I think you also probably heard in their stories, and certainly in my story, is that you can really, even without all the support that we do really want, you can uh, go ahead and make some choices that make uh, it just the life you want. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for listening in today. Hope you were inspired about what's possible and thank you, Brad and Josh, for the work you're doing to make a difference in men's lives. It's really, uh, I think, going to make a profound change for our children and our children's children. So thank you both. Thank, thank you. you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. You too.